Welcome to Lock and Key Unlocked, a podcast about Lock and Key on Netflix. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are going to be talking about Lock and Key Ray of F Star Star Star. No, Ray of fucking sunshine, you no, asshole. That's not the, hey, that's let's, not the let's title. Let's not jump to conclusions. Let's, let's not jump not to conclusions. Title. It's Ray of a uh, capital F, two stars, the le- and then Fucking. King, F King, which I assume is like I fucking hate you. Uh, wait. Maybe it means fuck King. Oh, okay. Well, obviously, or French Tyler. King. The French, French they used king. to have a king, right? Yeah. I, I think what a student of history you are. Yes. I think it's McDonald's taking a shot at Burger King. Is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, Ray of Fucking Sunshine is, of course, what it is. Uh, written by Vanessa Rojas and directed by Don Wilkinson. We are very much getting towards the end here. This is the eighth episode of the first season Woo-hoo! of the series. Lots of stuff going into this, but I think we could do a simple little recap as we go in here. Um, yeah. So basically what you need to know is a bunch of magical keys in a house. There's a bunch of kids who are trying to protect them. There's There's an entity named Dodge who wants them. And as time has gone on, we've slowly unraveled this mystery about the kid's father, Rendelock, who was killed by a guy named Sam Lesser, uh, who uh, was tied to some history back in the day of these keys. Now, last episode, Sam Lesser came to Key House, where everybody is living now, and tried to kill them once again, or more specifically, tried to find something called a head key that opens people's heads for Dodge, this evil entity. So everybody, uh, not all of the cards are on the table, but a lot of the cards are on the table at this point. I think you mean keys. Keys, right. It's not yes. lock and cards. Well, cards are like, uh, they're like flat keys. They can unlock oh, some sweet games you can play Holy with your friends. Holy fucking shit. <laughs> <laughs> What's uh how I know when I'm watching a good series is when I start to freak out when we get close to the end. Mm. Um, if I don't care about what's going on, I'm watching. I'm going, okay, I'll, I've got to go through two more episodes till the end. But this, it's really been like this thing of like, oh my god, since we've read the books, like I can't believe there's only two episodes. Are they going to try to fit it all in here? Holy shit. Yeah, it's been very exciting, and I think it's one of those shows that's been like it's hard to stop and do a podcast between episodes because I I want to keep watching. Yeah, it's it's very good. Uh, I think so far for me, without you know, I, I've obviously watched the whole season, but like so far for me, the last episode, the seventh episode, was definitely the emotional high point of the thing so far. Uh, this one I thought was very good, and there's a lot of real good elements in it, particularly when it gets to Nina, which the other little recappy thing we should probably mention is adults can't see the magic of the house. They can't see the magic of the keys. Right. Uh, Nina got involved Unless in some of the you're magic. you're drunk. Well, hold on. I that's called not, it. I that's called not recap. It. That's not, you ca- called not calling it based it. on reading the comic books, Pete. Oh, I'm sorry. No. I'm being nice. You called it based on reading the comic books. Was that better? <laughs> nice. Yeah. Was that more complimentary? Sometimes it's all in the performance, Alex. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Nita wasn't uh, dry for six years. She was an alcoholic before that. Um, but as of last episode, because of the stress of having Sam Lesser attack the house once again, she started drinking again, and that's something we're dealing with in this episode. A um, couple of other things we'll get to as we go, but the other thing that I just want to mention as we're kicking it off is that there are two sort of friends of the Locke family. There's the Whedon family. Ellie Whedon is the mother. Rufus Whedon is the son. Rufus Whedon has bonded with Bodie Locke, the youngest, and Ellie initially bonded with Nina Locke, the mom, except for the fact that Nina thought that maybe Ellie murdered the dean of the 11th grade of Matheson Academy, uh, where their kids go to school and where they live is in Matheson, uh, thought that maybe Ellie killed him. Um, well, we that could still be true. I mean, she right. was there. Yes, that is very true. She was there. We don't know exactly what's going on, uh, but certainly they had a dust up the last episode about it. So let's actually jump into it because there's a big thing that happens here. Um, Now, we've established this on other podcasts, but I just want to say that if you are just watching the show, we're not really going to get into comic book spoilers. But certainly, if you have read the comic book, this first scene... I think it's pretty clear what's going on. It's not revealed until later on the episode. 
Yeah, well, there's a lot of stuff, I think, from this episode that is straight from the comic in a way that I feel like we should reference, but not offer it up as uh, any spoilers going forward. Yeah. I feel. uh, Yeah, and so uh, what I'm hinting at is it starts off with Ellie and Rufus cooking um, a meal. They both seem very tense, very on edge, very nervous. And then a man that we haven't seen before comes down, and they're clearly terrified of him. Yeah, especially Rufus. And then Ellie is sort of like, like, uh, I'm the one who's orchestrating this. I'm the one who's tolerating this, even though I'm not. Uh, she's in the middle, basically. Right. And she says to this man, did you have a hand at what happened at Key House? And just to kind of like yeah. cut through it, because, again, they establish what it is at the end of the episode. I think we could jump ahead to the big spoiler here that this is, in fact, Lucas a.k.a. Lucas Caravaggio, who was friends with Rendell Locke back in the day. Best friends, in fact. Uh, and I think we've established this dated Ellie back in the day, right? Yes. Maybe yeah. maybe that's a comic book spoiler. I'm not 100% no, sure. No, no. They, they, uh, I think it was Rufus said something like that was his right. ex. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so dated back in the day. And that's, of course, this is another guys that Dodge is using, which is one of the big reveals at the end of the episode, which I will say, I think they played out quite well. Like, even if you know what's yeah. going on, it's, it's pretty clear. Yeah, yeah definitely. Was, es- especially with uh, since uh, which was a deviation from the comic, having Tyler uh, hook up with Dodge and then immediately spinning that into the gender swapped uh, Lucas um, as the uh, as Dodge, I thought was. Great. Really well. Use of the source material. I was worried because Gabe had a creepy uh, creepy feel that maybe Gabe was Dodge. Uh, But yeah, in this episode, they really kind of uh, took care of that. So it was was, it was fun to see how they revealed it. They gave it to you, didn't kind of explain it and then really kind of set it out for you. Gabe is just a dink. (laughs) He's just a little. uh, That's a good word for it. He's a dink. Yeah. Yeah. A dink. Uh, yeah, he's a real ray of F King sunshine, I would say. That's true. Uh, so yeah, Ellie asks, did you have a hand at what happened at Key House? Lucas doesn't really answer. And then we do cut over to Key House where Tyler and Kinsey are cleaning up. Uh, and here's the thing that I really liked as a thread through this episode to really center it is everybody is bringing them food. Like everybody's bringing them casseroles, bringing them food. And I got to tell you, I never really had that experience. Like I grew up in a... I'd say mid-sized town, but that mm. feels like a very small town thing to me, right? Did you? Well, it, also, you have- it also depends on like what's going on. Like, yeah, yeah. When somebody dies, if it's yeah. a, you know, there's definitely like I've been around my mom, and we grew up in a pretty mid-sized. So that we went to people's houses, and like my mom spent a lot of time cooking for like you know, people going through stuff or certain things. I think it is very much a small town thing, but I think it also depends on the close knit community that you kind of are in and stuff like that. Yeah. But Alex, was your family like hated? <laughs> were yeah, hated we're family? The, we were the outcasts. We yeah. were, uh, we were so rich we could buy and sell that town. Nah, and wow. I would usually walk up to people with my tight uh, polo shirt buttoned all the way up and my golf club over my shoulder tight and polo say, shirt. <laughs> uh, it's, Shit's Creek is based on your family, right? Yeah, we're the shit. Yeah, that's what we would always <laughs> yeah. say. Zalbin's Creek. Yeah. Uh, I, I grew up in a small town, and yes, f- any food, it was food coming and going all the time whenever there was any sort of tragic uh, situation. Yeah. And the, yeah. the hardest part is afterwards returning the uh, the cookware. The, the Tupperware, dishes. the cookware, yeah, yeah. It's who gave what to who could be yeah, a nightmare. You got to write your name on the bottom or else it's like, here I am dealing with this tragic thing, and then I got to sort through a bunch of old dishes. Yeah, you feel like back. a real asshole. You're like, hey, sorry about your dad died. Hey, do you have my mom's dish anywhere? <laughs> and then they're like, you know. I, I, I have a general rule, honestly. Like, if I bring something over at a Tupperware, I'm bringing it back. At the end of my visit, otherwise, what? It's, really, yeah. Otherwise, How do you it's lost. orchestrate that. Well, Wait, if pull, I bring it over it on like, the floor, like, like a real <laughs> shit, I attach it to a very long string that stretches all the way back to my house. And at a certain point, I just yank it. Wow. See, I have the opposite. Um, I'm like, if I brought this Tupperware of stuff over, I'm calling the Tupperware a loss. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's the other edge of the spectrum. Like, if I can't take it back for whatever reason at the end of the visit. Then it's just it's gone. 
That's why I always steal like a treasured item or some silverware from people's houses <laughs> as, <laughs> as recompense. Oh my God. <laughs> treasured item. You're the I, worst. In fact, I, let me just say, I have so many of your baby teeth, Pete. <laughs> oh. oh, I was wondering why my uh, big uh, baby book was lighter than normal. Yep, it's yeah. just a couple teeth lighter. And I have <laughs> them. I'm making a necklace out of them. <laughs> oh. Instead of shark's teeth, you got baby's teeth? Those yeah. are the only items that are worth anything in Pete's collection are his baby teeth because he held them back for a rainy day because he wants to eventually put them all under his pillow. And then he's yeah, like exactly. a killing. It really a killing. cash out. Oh that Plus, compound tooth fairy interest. Yeah, yeah. nobody about knows it. Like, about. When we were kids, it was like uh, you know a quarter. Now kids are getting like bills for their teeth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tooth fairy is going to be like you're killing me here. Yes, the classic tooth fairy, the Dwayne the Rock Johnson. That is. <laughs> Everybody knows what we're talking about here. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, Tyler and Kinsey are cleaning up. They get these casseroles. Everybody's bringing them food, uh, and then we get like just a classic fill in on what's going on. Kinsey fills him in on the black door, which is a strange glowing portal down in the drowning caves that she was drawn towards, um, and she very in quickly a super figured- creepy way. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I like the scene because she owns up to that. Like we've speculated a lot about what went on with Kinsey down at that door. And she establishes pretty clear in this episode that she's like, yeah, that was weird. I was yeah. drawn yeah, to but that. I was also a little bit bummed. Like, like they didn't deal with that at all. Like you couldn't pull her away from that door before. And now she's just super cash. I liked how casual she was. And we talked about this in the last episode, I think, um, Alex, about how is she still a little bit under the influence of the door or is it just a sort of a weird memory that faded? Mm -hmm. And I actually think based on this episode, it's just a weird memory. Like she's not being drawn there. It's just, hey, yeah, this door, something's up with it. The fact that it's a glowing sci-fi door is one thing. And two, it made me really want to get behind it. Yeah, but I... I was kind of, when they started to be like, yeah, we're, it's in the cave. So I'm like, oh, Tyler, you're going to go with her? Cool, bro. Good luck getting her out of that cave. But it was almost like such a non-issue. I was a little let down. I can see what you're saying there. I think for the action of the show, it makes sense to pivot at this point to Tyler and Kinsey being the heroes that we need them to be as we enter the yes, end game here. we need them. Uh, but yes, I... I'd be curious. I would like to see a little more temptation on the side of the Locke family. Um, I like that thread. But as you're saying, Justin, I think we're done with it at this point. Uh, She fills him in on the black door. She also very quickly figures out that Dodge wants the head key to find out where the black door is. Like she starts putting the clues together, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, And then at that point, we get Nina's main thing. She is. Yes, Pete. Yes, Pete. Sorry. Uh. No, it's the, fine. I love to hear from you. The ta- uh, <laughs> oh, the, I'm sorry. when he holds up I his love phone to is, hear from you. The when he holds up the phone and does the whole tide app thing, that was pretty funny. That was yeah. a funny bit. That's the difference between being like uh sixteen and being seventeen is <laughs> that knowing about tides. Yeah. yeah. Uh sixteen you're on TikTok, seventeen you're on Tide Todd. Wow. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, Sometimes you don't have to blur something out right away. You can think about it a little bit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Maybe uh, we well, need a – is there a way – is there a joke swap key? Like a gender <laughs> swap? We could just plug it in. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? That would be uh, – I'd use the I shit out of that, key. that. <laughs> I'd be fucking abusing that every day. I'd have that around oh, my man. neck, in my hand. i jabbing that in my mouth. Oh. <laughs> Get that out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Why did uh, you put that visual out there? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so Nita is glowingly happy. She's vacuuming. Oh. And again, I love the reaction here. Like Tyler and Kinsey immediately are not like, like we don't have to go through an arc where Tyler and Kinsey are like, wow, that's weird. Why mom's so happy. What's right. going on with mom until they figure it out. And they're like, whoa, mom's been drinking. Immediately they're off put by how happy she is. And immediately Tyler's like, I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to look for a stash. And I thought that was great. And I've never personally have experience with this either, but it does feel very true to families and people who deal with addiction. 
Yeah, it's all about the logistics because um, they know that the argument part is useless and actually it just makes it worse. So Yeah, you've got you can't dance around the lie. You've got to have proof to show in their face that you know it's brutal. And I was very even even beyond proof, they just need to remove the alcohol. Because if she can't get the alcohol, then she can't get they know it's a one to one relationship. If she has alcohol, she's going to drink it when she is off fully off the wagon. Right. But also, like, when you saw Tyler's face, when she, like, uh, he was close to her mouth and he smelled it immediately. Love that moment. That's yeah. a real, real moment. You, That's one of the first things you do when somebody's kind of struggling with that. And trying to hide the sta- find somebody's stash is tough. Yeah. People are sneaky, man. Well, turns out she's not completely stinky. She just puts it like in the back of the sink. But yeah. Yeah, granted, well, they don't. Still, find it. I mean, of all the places to look, that's pretty smart. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's back there with other bottles of shit. It look could look like a spray bottle or something. You know. Hmm. I mean, if anything, you should probably put it in a spray bottle because that would be fun. You know, just like spray a bun straight. That's drink. a great way to poison yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Also, don't do that. Uh, so Kinsey is worried uh, because they've been lying to her. They feel like that's <laughs> going to, what, exacerbate the situation? What, that I no, I just like that? that you're like, hey, here's some alcohol tips. <laughs> <laughs> Looking to hide your booze? Listen to <laughs> Zalbin's alcohol tips. Yeah, I've never dealt with the situation because nobody's found me out so far. Uh, so too dark. Uh, so yeah. then she finds a pick of Aaron Voss, which is a big deal. Vossi. We've gotten hints about this before. Vossi, yeah. who's uh, the Voss? who is one of the other members of Rendell's friend group from back yeah, in the day. In the pick. Uh, what? She's in the group pick. Yes, yeah, she's in the group pick. She dated Rendell. Is what we find yes. out. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't Crushing know if that's on. been established before. Uh, and the clues that they put together over the course of the episode are that Aaron is the person that was hinted that went insane at Key House. And, of course, she is, in fact, at an asylum living out there frozen in a wheelchair. That is the woman that Dodge uh, visited a couple of uh, episodes back. Yeah. Uh, so we get all of that looped together, which is very nice. Uh, speaking... Uh, one one thing that I thought was interesting about this episode, it felt like last episode, we finally got the locks all coming together. And mm-hmm. this episode, Bodie comes in and is like, what are we going to do about Dodge? And they're like, get out of here, Bodie, which yeah. was weird to me. Like, that was kind of a weird move to have them push him to the side at well, this was- point. Because it was, they were just talking about their mom's alcoholism, and I feel like that's a little bit above his age range, you know. Well, so you were going to say pay like, grade, right, Pete? You almost said I pay was. Grade? I was going to say pay grade, okay. yeah. <laughs> but he even says later they're trying to protect me, so they're pushing me out. So uh, yeah, I like that they ID'd that. Yeah, um, as and as I like the that he why. ID'd it. Yeah, and I mean, like I like it. This in this scene we're talking about now, he's got his eyes on the keys. He's always the one who's like. Sort of the the, prize. the most in the game, yeah. But I do think the function of this is to put Bodie with Rufus to be the outside faction that Dodge just doesn't care about. It's and just Rufus like oh, it's they just can't unbel- hurt me. Oh, I'm sorry. I was saying that that Bodie and Rufus are Dodge discounts are like these two kids. They can't hurt me. They're stupid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm really threatened by Tyler and uh, to a lesser extent Kinsey. They're the people I have to defeat. And yeah. if, you know, if you watched one episode of Scooby-Doo, you don't underestimate kids. Everybody should know that by now. This is true. Um, but I love And dogs. Uh, yeah. Um, especially dogs that can kind of talk. Um, but I feel like uh, this episode in particular, we got to spend uh, time with Rufus. And, man, the guy who's playing Rufus is really unbelievable. And Kobe I love, Bird. like... The moment that they have where Rufus is almost going to tell Bodie about the secret, you know, and that was really cool. Well, yeah, we'll we'll get to that in a moment. First, though, we get another uh, comic book character we visit with a little bit more is Detective Matuku, whose first name is Daniel. Uh, He visits Nina, uh, kind of uh, is pushing her to be like, why don't you just leave? Why don't you just get out of this town? (laughs) Uh, which I like. Like, he visits her as a friend. And yep. an interesting way, we've talked a lot about Nina's arc here, because 
it's not exactly that she's side to the narrative of the comics, but she's not directly tied to the main narrative a lot of the time. And here, Nita's thing almost always seems to be like she gets a friend, something horrible happens with a friend, she loses that friend and then gets a new friend. Uh, yeah. And that's what happens with Daniel, a.k.a. Detective Matuku here. Um and he also, like everybody else, immediately catches on to the fact that she's drinking. Yeah. yeah. But I do think he genuinely cares. Like, he, yes. this is, he didn't need to do this. He, he came over here to be like, hey, I'm curious. I've been thinking about you, and I'm wondering why you don't just leave. Yeah. Which is a, a sensible question and something that, uh, I mean, I think the answer he arrives at is like, oh, you're dealing with it by drinking right now. Which, yeah, he's, mm-hmm. he's almost disappointed in her. It was kind I think of an interesting is, yeah. scene, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll see where that goes. Uh, he does leave, though, uh, says she can talk to him anytime. Maybe shades of a romantic relationship. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what see. happens. Uh, but th- at that point, Nina does get another drink. We find out it's hidden under the sink. Uh, she does the cleanup and the scope. And I I mean, I hated, but I loved the routine of this. Again, it felt like she's got this all down. She takes the drink. Oh, yeah. She drinks the scope. She cleans herself off. She's ready to go. And yeah. it's so sad to watch. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree, but I like the way they did it. They didn't do it as like in a showy way that it is like, no, this is what she does. This is why she's been this way for so long. Yeah. And then we get the big thing that happens in the episode. She looks in the mirror and she sees the evil mirror Nina, who she saw back in episode one. Shocked, she drops the mug, breaks it and cries. Yeah. Yeah. So sad because we know this is the mug that Rendell gave her back in the day, essentially for being sober. So, like, she can't control herself. She has this addiction. She's battling against it. And that crying moment is like she realizes what's happening to her, but she can't stop it. It's like being on a roller coaster. Yeah, yeah and it's it's wild that she's drinking out of this mug that was a symbol from her dead husband that like hey you've conquered this or at least it's under control and then she breaks it and then we see later in the episode she gets it back and which I think allows her to complete the cycle I actually don't think we're going to see her drinking as much in the last couple episodes we'll see we'll see I I don't know I haven't watched them Alex knows so this is yeah I just feel like I won't say I won't say interesting you bring that up Justin because it's like it's such a kind of like fuck it, I'm going to drink out of my sobriety mug. Like, that's fucked up. Like, you could have picked any other mug to drink out of. You yeah. know, it's kind of like when you see somebody who's got, like, a uh, a bong that's, like, a, the shape of a gun. It's like, do you, do you need to do that? Is that necessary? Like, Well, <laughs> well I know. mean, listen, like, I might get in trouble for equating this, but there's a certain sense where you could say addiction is kind of like self-harm, right? Where you know you're doing something that is hurting you, and it specifically is to hurt you so that you can feel this thing. And it's like touching the soreness, touching the pain. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't... um, I'm just saying, try to take it a little easier on yourself, but you know, know, people go through things differently. I I wasn't trying to... Yeah, like I bought bought a... I bought a bong gun. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's me. Yeah. No, I don't think you said anything wrong, Pete. I think it's just like that. That is what I take for the reason she's using that mug is yeah. she's daring herself to hit rock bottom, basically. Like yeah. she is daring herself to get to that point where she breaks the mug or more specifically daring herself to get to the point where she breaks the thing that she breaks at the end of the episode. Uh, but she breaks yeah. the mug, gets terrified, yeah. and puts it in the cabinet that she found in the ping pong room, again, a couple of episodes back, that Bodhi tried to use a key on, thought it was a portal to Narnia, and it turned out, as far as he could tell, to be nothing. Right. Um, at that point, uh, we get the dar- doorbell rings. But Jack- I just want to say, I really like the moment of, like, Tyler getting close, so she kind of freaks out, and that is the reason she kind of like hastily throws mm-hmm. it in that cabinet, just so it's yeah. out of eyesight, so he doesn't kind of put two and two together, because she's yeah. still trying to like you know keep up this lie. So I thought that was a really well orchestrated moment. Yep. Uh, so the doorbell rings, as I was saying, uh, Jackie, who is Tyler's kind of girlfriend, who he sort of fucked over the last episode. On again, off again. No, no, he was a complete douche. That was that was awful what he did. 
Yeah, and Gabe, who is sort of seeing Kinsey, uh, they both show up and they brought competing chowders. Uh, I gotta say, too much chowder. Like, what? I, I appreciate this as a running joke. Maybe oh. just the fact that I don't like clown chowder, but that's like that's oh, a lot. That's of chowder. exactly what this is. Definitely, if this, this is was chowder. Like Oreos, chowder you would be losing your fucking mind. Really? If yeah, somebody showed up and being like two bags of chowder. Yeah, I mean, chowder is, a, first off, a great gift. It's a fantastic <laughs> and gift. T- tasting two different chowders. Oh, and being, right next and like, to wait, each other? That's like, uh, what an afternoon. Yeah, yeah, that's like a fucking, you know, you're the king of England or whatever. You get to have two chowders brought to you, and you can fucking decide what one you're going to eat. That Listen, day. man, yes. I've ne- I'm not, I'm Jewish, as I've talked about on many podcasts, and I've never really had that experience of Christmas morning, you run downstairs, first thing in the morning, and there, under the tree, is just like dozens of different chowders. Yes, Fuck the, you the, for the, putting that image in my head, because <laughs> that would be the greatest morning of all time. The Christmas chowders, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When um, uh, well, actually, New England in there. <laughs> <laughs> New England Santa Claus uh, mm-hmm. with a thick Boston accent shows up with a series of chowders. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he shows chowders. up, comes down. Uh, he doesn't come down the trip deep because he's like, nah, fuck that. I'm not going to fucking do that. Yeah, comes he breaks the fucking breaks window because he's from Boston. <laughs> Yeah, wow. comes in, he's like, hey, I got a fucking ladle. I'm going to put some uh, fucking chowder in your stockings. What do you think about that? And you're like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. The fucked up thing is he puts it in your stockings. He puts it in your mouth even when you're sleeping and it burns your <laughs> mouth, but it tastes good. Yeah, I know it what you've been so fucking sleeping because I'm fucking putting some chowder in your mouth. Yeah. How do you like them apples? a great way to get woken up. <laughs> but the old good phrase, oh, I, you, I woke up like I had a bunch of chowder in my mouth. <laughs> Hey, Merry Christmas, you fucking animals. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, they show up with some shouters. Uh, Nita uh, is back at the height. She is the matic phase, completely embarrasses them about, oh, I'm so excited that you're in relationships. I just meant friendships. Ha, 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 ha. And everybody's yeah. very awkward and embarrassed. So they all go upstairs. The doorbell rings again. A lot Ellie of doorbell and- action. Hot Big doorbell visit. action. Elliot and Rufus are there. They've got a chowder, not a chowder. They've got like a soup or a stew or something like that. Looks like a stew or maybe a mac and cheese. Yes. Mm, that what, would be nice. Who, who are you talking about? They, they have a covered dish as well. Because when you're bringing what a you dish over. Ellie? Yeah. It's a soup. She talked about she was making a stew. Mm. Yeah. Uh, maybe she pivoted to a chowder at some point. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that happens between scenes on a TV show. I mean, I'm not saying it was a chowder, but I'm saying when you bring a covered dish to someone going through something, make it something good. Like, don't yeah. bring like a vegetable. It's yeah. a, it's a stew, man. Why why are you? She brought stew. They have Do so you know what would have been a good scene is if Nina was like, "Ooh, what is this chowder?" and then opened it up is like, "What is this? A fucking stew?" and then threw it on the floor. Yeah, wow. and then she put it in the cabinet and it met, and it brought it back Wait, together. Do both you guys not like stew. I'm I mean, not as much into stew. I'm more into chowder. Well, obviously, but <laughs> stews, you know, I wouldn't kick stew out of bed. Stew's <laughs> still great. <laughs> I wouldn't kick stew out of it. I mean, I'd and, still, uh, I'd still yeah. like hook up with stew. <laughs> I'd fuck Listen, stew. You know, I, you know, sometimes you get a little stew. It's nice. Wow, you, this is really a sexual turn with the soups. Yeah. How uh, how long do you heat up the stew beforehand, Pete? I just want to know, just for reference. <laughs> Luke one. <laughs> I don't know. I Put don't it on high for like a minute and a half so it doesn't get too hot, but like a little warm. And oh then late God. 90s, Pete wrote one of the follow-ups to American Pie, which is American Stew. <laughs> <laughs> About uh, fucking a stew. <laughs> yeah. We're going to lose our virginity before we go out for chowder. Uh, so, uh, Jackie and Tyler talk very sweet conversation between them. He apologizes. She's like, yeah, you better apologize. Uh, but I thought that was great. I, I accepted this reconciliation personally. Uh, she was a little too nice, but you know, that's her choice. Well, he just, Tyler just went through. He fucked a demon in a car. He didn't mention that part. Yeah, he didn't yeah, come fully clean. He was like, hey, I'm actually more of a dick than I'm letting on. I'm not telling you about the awful part. Yeah. Piece of shit. Wow, okay. Uh, And uh, then Ellie uh, 
comes in, uh, Ellie sees Kinsey and Kinsey's like, Hey, has anybody weird been around? I like this moment quite a bit as well. Yeah. And you can yeah. see just Ellie petrified freezing up yeah. and she's, and then she says, you know, it's a girl about yay high. And she's like, oh, that was the real no. hint. That yeah. was the hint right there. It yeah. was the hint right there. Uh, but it also does a nice job of, I think, throwing you off the scent there again, if you don't know the continuity of the comic. Yeah, and, but I don't know. You see, Ellie is she's hella guilty through this whole thing. Yeah. Like you know, yeah. something is going to be worse for her going forward, which I thought was great. That uh, you could tell by the stew that she was hella guilty. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. If she was on the up and up, she would have brought. I don't know. Like I'm just gonna throw this out there. Some sort of chowder. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The uh, murderer was the... obviously the one holding the stew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bodhi gets. Invited I can't wait over for the next Rufus's... episode where it takes place at a chowder place. Yeah, uh, yeah. I love that. I would love that. Uh, I will actually mention I interviewed Darby Stanchfield for my day job, and I asked her about the chowder stuff because it was such a big part of the show. Uh, And it turns out when they were filming Lock and Key in, oh my gosh, I'm completely blanking on the name of the town in Nova Scotia, but there was literally only one restaurant open. That was it. Like the whole place was shut down because of the middle of the winter, but she did say the chowder was pretty good. There you go. So there you go. So she's on the up and up. Uh, So uh, Bodie gets invited over to Rufus's house. And then we get Kinsey talking to Gabe. Uh, He's asking a lot of questions about when uh, Sam came back uh, and the kids and how she's doing. Um, He asks about the keys, stuff like that. Um, How are you feeling about the Kinsey-Gabe relationship at this point? I'm feeling better about it. I'm feeling a little better. Gabe's a dink. Don't like Gabe. I'm not pulling (laughs) for them. I just, I don't think he's as evil as I originally thought. I'm still pulling for Scott. You could tell by the conversation that Scott Mm -hmm. is the real connection. Exactly. Scott would want to use the guy. That's why he came down the stairs. But uh, I still, I feel a little bit better about Gabe. Uh, yeah, I mean, Scott does immediately show up, but he's very cute and very stammery and is like, I, that, once you were attacked by a madman who killed your dad, it put kind of put everything in perspective for me, which is a very yeah. cool thing to do. He got her some ice cream and wants to start the relationship anew, and it seems kind of nice until Gabe comes down, and then they're all awkward, and everybody decides to head off. Um, so yeah. then we cut over to the Whedon house. I did like the... I to oh, give yeah. a little bit of credit to the dink. Uh, I did like when he was like, "Yeah, I'm going to go too," but I'm going to wait a minute for yeah, Scott to sort of not pull bad out. for a dink. Yeah, it's yeah. a good. It's a dink. It's a dink thing yeah, to say. Good, good dink move. No. Good. Uh, dink. That's a better. Bodie dink. is making models with Rufus. Uh, Bodie go. kind of asks him a roundabout about what's going on with Dodge. Some advice there, and Rufus is like. I want to know, listen, I've got some info on it. enemy. Is that the sort of thing I should tell, even if I've been sworn to secrecy? At which point Lucas enters. Rufus says, oh, that's his cousin. Uh, Ellie has some cookies for him. Again, everybody terrified out of their minds of this guy. Yeah. But I, I also love- like Bodie knows something is up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bodie's reaction to this whole scene is just great. He's just like, "Yo, yeah. what is your deal, creep?" Yeah, like I'm he's not so up direct to you, you creepy, creepy dude. Yeah, yeah. very fun. Uh, Nina. Then we cut back to Nina. She opens the cabinet and finds out the mug is fixed, uh, and oh, we enter man. into the real what? I was just saying that it's got to be an amazing, like, of all all the things you can put in there, that's an amazing feeling to find out you have a cabinet that can fix everything. Well, well I liked, it, I liked that she was going to fix it herself. She walked up to the yeah. cabinet with super glue. So she was going to put it back together, and it was going to be, like, ugly and messy, but it was going to work. And then this cabinet is a shortcut and does it uh, by itself. So I thought that was a cool sort of comment on what the keys do mm-hmm. in general. And then great use of the theme music here. It yeah. comes in right when she opens it and sees the mug, and it's just like cue- yeah. cueing us in like, oh, this is the magic of Key House here. Yeah. Well, also to your point, Justin, I think that gets to the metaphor of what's going on with her with her alcoholism is 
she had clearly kind of hit rock bottom, gone manic, gone depressive, manic depressive, back and forth. And she was getting to the point where she's like, all right, I need to deal with this. And then she gets this easy shortcut. And that's the same thing yeah. as the booze. It is an easy shortcut to feeling good for her. Uh, yeah. And that she reaches, again, a literal breaking point by the end of the episode that hopefully means she is going to actually have to put in the work and make some change and the magic is not going to help her with this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, she opens the cabinet. It breaks her brain very clearly. She talks yeah. to Kinsey, thinks she is cracking up. Uh, Nina grabs Sally the whale. Pete, you must've been happy about that. Yes. The more just a perfectly stuffed animal right there. You know what I mean? Like really retains its back to its glory. It's nothing like a nice stuffed animal. That may, uh, reminds me of a question I have for you, Pete. How many stuffed animals are currently on your bed? <laughs> None. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. And uh, just as a little caveat there, um, a nice crock of stew doesn't count as a stuffed animal. Because it's going to get stuff later when you're an animal. You know what I'm talking about, Pete? Oh, High my five. God. You're a High ridiculous five. human being. No. Put your hand down. Can you oh, use okay. the, the key on that one, Alex, real quick? <laughs> oh, yeah. The joke key? Oh, the fuck key. Oh, my mouth. Don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, so she puts the whale in the cabinet. It fixes the whale. Uh, she tells Kinsey she remembers her reflection. She doesn't understand at all about the keys. But Kinsey very calmly tells her she doesn't think she's crazy and then goes and talks to Tyler and tells Love Tyler. Kinsey in that moment. What? Loved the way Kinsey talked to her mom and they handled that information. Yeah. Really great. Well, and I also like the fact that she immediately goes and talks to Tyler, which is a big step yeah. for her as well. Uh, it yeah. tells him that Nina is seeing the magic and retaining it. Tyler is like, it's because she's drunk and figures that yeah. out. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, she rips up a book, fixes it, is very excited, goes to tell them and does a classic only hearing part of the conversation thing. She yeah. only he overhears them talking about uh, that she's continuing to drink, uh, <laughs> and they think it's driving her crazy. Bless you, Pete. Uh, oh, and God. she walks away, but doesn't hear that they're actually worried about her uh, and yeah. wondering what to do. Uh, so then yeah. we get to a thing that I want to talk about when it pays off, but we definitely should talk about Tyler puts on Rendell's jacket. And yes. I do think... This makes a lot of emotional sense based on what happened in the last episode where Tyler finally dealt with his demons when Sam came back, dealt with the fact that, like, no, it's not actually his dad, his fault that his dad is dead. Uh, yeah. And so he is ready to be like, I'm going to put on my dad's stuff. I'm going to embrace my dad's legacy again. So I thought that part was great. But um, the reason he has to is because he was fucking a demon in a truck. That's why. No, no, that's no. not why he what? has to do Wait, what? <laughs> this not where he left his jacket. Yes, no, but I, I think the yeah. so I, that's fucking, true. Don't give me the uh, uh, and then be like, oh, yeah, you're right. But the the choice of being comfortable putting on his father's jacket is more of a symbolic thing, as Alex is saying, to show like he's ready to step into the role as the hero of the story. Um, and I think you're does, reaching. I think it was just that that's the only jacket he's got now. It's definitely not something that happens by accident because of what happens yeah. later on in the episode. I mean, but, generally, TV writers would be like, I don't know what's fucking happened here. Are you like uh, missing a jacket? Let's just put on a jacket. Let's give it no deeper meaning. Yeah, no, I'm not right? saying that. I'm just saying that, like, he lost the jacket because he was fucking a demon. Now he has to wear his dad's jacket. That clearly bothers you. But sometimes you got to leave some clothes behind. Yeah. <laughs> Never leave clothes behind, man. Why? Yeah. No clothes you, you, left I, behind. Right? That's right. right. They always go back from clothes story when they're like, no you, you, clothes, clothes left behind. stuffed animals. You always go back, man. Yeah. All of our <laughs> clothes come alive at night and they talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. Clothes. Uh, then we cut over to Dodge. Wait, wait, Dodge. So is, oh, yeah, is the yes. jacket like the replacement for the hat and lure? Mm, oh, right. So for those of you who haven't read the comic, there is a hat with a lure that Rendell gives to Tyler that he wears all the time. And yes. so I would say yes, because he hasn't uh, worn a hat at all in this series. Yeah, the hat's was, not around. Yeah, there is is there is no hat, which is kind of a thing that like I miss. But I was worried when he put on the jacket. I was like, oh no, because in the comics, mom got drunk, thought you know the uh, the son was the father for a moment, and that got fucking weird fast. So um, 
I'm glad we didn't see that. Well, yeah, I mean, we could jump ahead and talk about that when he comes back. Uh, now, you know what? Actually, let's hold on because there's a lot of other stuff that happens between yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so Dodge goes to visit Aaron in the asylum. A magician is entertaining people. She makes a very funny pun about keys and reveals yeah. that she's going to use the head key. She wants the Omega key. Meanwhile, Kinsey and Tyler go down to the drowning caves. Uh, Tyler. Uh, Super cash. She, what? Super cash. Super cash. Mm -hmm. But they go down to the dry caves. They're safe this time. And Kinsey is regretting everything. Uh, And we've talked about this a lot on the podcast. But, like, the fear, taking out her fear from her head initially made her kind of a jerk about everything. And it almost feels like her head is trying to compensate at this point. Like, she's been through stuff and she's getting some of that feeling back. Well, and I think in the, when she first got rid of the fear, she talked about it like it was uh, a buzz, like a little bit of an addiction. And I think now she's like equalizing a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I said last time that she was fearless and also shameless. And it feels like now she's coming to down to earth with like getting the rest of those emotions back and being more of a normal person. Right. And she specifically calls out that back during Sam's first attack, she should have grabbed the poker that was near her to take him out. And this time when he attacked, she should have taken his gun. And Tyler's like, no, you were protecting Bodhi both times. That was your job. And I love that moment. Like, again, I think this gets back to Tyler is prepared to try to be Rendell in the right way rather than the wrong way, how he was a couple of episodes back, just bossing everybody around. And here he's giving Rendell style advice to Kinsey and calming her down, telling her the right thing. And I also think part of that you could intuit. That's why they're prepared to approach the black door and not be tempted by it is yeah. they're together and they're emotionally together as well. Well, and also they didn't yeah, look it's I, beautiful, I, man. didn't look through the keyhole. Uh, too, right. which feels like the more uh, direct thing that draws yeah. you in. Basically, you don't want to pull a porkies in this type situation. Yeah, oh, exactly. Come on, man. And be everyone better, definitely better. knows what you're talking about. I'll tell you what, uh, I've never seen porkies, but I've seen the poster and I was like, what is going on in this movie? Wow. I want to see it. It seems pretty raunchy. Dude, walk away, please. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, that was a that was a comedy, all right. So I'm a, I'm a allowed to talk about it. I think. Um, <laughs> all right, let's not make it weird. Uh, so then we see um, they see the carved names, the famous, the Be iconic honest. from the comic. The keeper. Were you looking the for keys. your name? What's that? Be honest. Were you looking for your name? N- no, definitely not. That would be real weird. <laughs> Well, you're like, oh, the here's these three podcasters on there. Yeah, uh, I will say, Pete, they our names weren't featured in the main story plot of the. No, <laughs> of I know, only but, in the very last page. Yeah, of the after last. after everything, it was the last page that was said. You know, thanks to the keeper of the keys, which on that stone said the keeper of the keys. I think what you're getting at is you were looking for your name, right, Pete? Yeah, I think no, that's. I was. I was just wondering if, like, you know, maybe there would be some main ones, but some other ones you couldn't really read too mm-hmm. well or whatever. That would be a fun little nod, but, you know. Well, in the book itself, it is just those names, and I think it does make sense to have those names and not uh, people who don't exist in the main narrative of Lock and Key. Sure. I'd say sure. Yet. yet. Sure, sure, yet. makes sense. Yet. They're coming, though. They're coming. But Again, maybe if Justin, you open the black light amazing, door, high, you see yeah. different names on the walls. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. This and maybe is, this like makes a black sense. light poster of sexual positions or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they see Aaron Voss's name, which is when they really put it all together. Kinsey immediately figures out, oh, she's at the asylum um, and uh, figures out exactly what Dodge is going to do. But as they find out, as we find out, they're a little too late because Dodge is already there, goes into Aaron's head. Gross Aaron, noise. She used the head key, so we get the gross noise. Yes, meat, we do get the gross noise. noise. Meaty oh, noise. Okay. Uh, and uh, Aaron is not there. She's not outside the door, as we've seen before. It's also the door to Matheson Academy. And when once Dodge goes in, it's Matheson Academy, but it's completely overgrown. Mm-hmm. The memories mm-hmm. are stored as VHS tapes. Oh, yeah, VHS tapes. Really? I thought that was cool. 
Yeah, yeah, man. No, I thought that was cool as well. I'm just saying, like, I don't get too excited about VHS tapes. They're really, uh, they're very old, them. inferior format. Wow, sure. What an wow. adopter when you over say here. it like a fucking dick. Yeah, but mm-hmm. I thought you know brings you back to when you were a little kid and you would play VHS tapes. Or Alex, you're, you're going to be the first to get a cyborg implant, and as you're all you're going to talk about, and I it's going to end up being a mistake. But I'll tell yeah. you what, if you go back and watch Porky's, the only way to watch it is on oh VHS. Why That's the way double they down. It. Why would you double down on that? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm probably going to triple down by the end of this. Oh, <laughs> so, That's true. That's a threat. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, young Erin is trapped inside of her own mind, which I thought was a very neat twist. I like that quite a bit. Uh, well, and if we can just talk here about there yeah. is a big difference from in the in the comic book, and this isn't a spoiler, it's just a, a different way they did it. Um, Aaron's mind is wiped clean. When they open up uh, in the in the comics, the head key, you actually, the top of the scalp flips open, you see inside the head. And uh, hers is the only head that's been fully wiped clean with just the word Dodge written uh, inside. And obviously you can't do that here, so I really liked the way this was done. And I think... It was a very telling choice not to have Aaron appear outside of her, the second Aaron appear. And I, I'm curious to see where that ends up. Um, yeah. And I, I kind of like the fact that, like, because she is trapped inside her own mind, she can't really communicate with the outside world. So that's why she's kind of in the asylum. I thought that was kind of cool. Well, I think we could also say that because we did talk about this on the podcast where we talked about this issue that uh, Aaron Voss in the comics is African-American and the issue in particular, they end up using something called the skin key where Kinsey and Bodie become black uh, in order to get into the asylum and talk to Aaron Voss, because one of the only words that she keeps saying is white, white, white. And people keep interpreting that as anti-white racism on her part. Yeah. Uh, it turns out it's white, 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 because she has been completely washed clean. There's nothing in her head, as they find out. But uh, the skin key, as we talked about, is one of the things that like does not age well. Like It didn't no. age well at all. So I wonder if there was certainly like a cascading series of choices here where they're like, well, we can't use the skin key. Because I think we could say, as we find out by the end of the episode, uh, it's something called the identity key instead, which can change... Uh, Dodge to Lucas and vice versa. Uh, And here, deciding not to use the skin key in this way means like, okay, we're not going to do the Aaron Voss white, white, white thing. So what else can we do? Yeah. And I like Uh, the smart change. That was even without this sort of like race issue, not aging well, that was always sort of an an odd thing. It was like a very the plot spinning on such a, a mistaken interpretation like that. And I think this is just a cleaner way through the whole story. Yeah. I agree. Uh, And instead of that, so we get uh, Dodge finds a memory inside with the Omega key, which is, of course, what she's really afterwards. Uh, Kinsey realizes that Dodge is already there when she excuse me, when she signs in. Uh, They both there's a great shot. And I love this again with just like practical effects. Dodge uses the anywhere key to leave Aaron Voss's room as Kinsey is coming into the room. And it's clearly like a split frame, but it's done so neatly and cleanly. It works. And that's great. 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 No lights, no effects or anything like that. Just like in the camera. Really well done. It was Uh, it was a tense moment too, building up to that because I'm like, Kinsey, why are you running? You know what I mean? You're not even ready to fight Dodge like. It was a crazy moment and, mm-hmm. and it handled so well. Yeah. Uh, so Dodge goes into Rufus's house, immediately breaks his toy there, which gives us an indication of what's about to happen. But meanwhile, Kinsey talks to Aaron. Aaron initially isn't saying anything. And then she starts saying, Dodge, Dodge, Dodge. And she's like, Dodge is here. Aaron's clearly trying to say no. And she hands her the picture of Rendell and his friends from high school yeah. and discovers. She's like, no way, that's Lucas, and realizes that Lucas is Dodge, at which point we get the big reveal scene. Dodge uses the key, pushes it in her shin, and turns it to Lucas. Uh, Great. Just so well done. 
all well done, like a perfect way to sort of release this secret while at the same time moving the story forward. Really well done uh, throughout this whole section. I also yeah. lo- wanted to point out that um, Dodge snapping Rufus's action figure is um, the cruelty of Dodge is one of the main things that, mm-hmm. that keeps undoing her plans. Because it's, it's a weird move. Uh, like, yeah, it is just cruel for no reason. But I thought maybe like she was looking for the key. Like it was inside because we at that point didn't know where the head key was. Um, or the Omega key. Uh, so that I thought was like, that was like part of her, but it was revealed. She's just being an asshole. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I like about this, just on a structural perspective is introducing Lucas and resolving that in one episode. So we, as viewers don't get ahead of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is great. Like very, just smart choices across the board. Uh, and then we go back to key house where Nina, gets the gut-wrenching idea to take the urn with Rendell's ashes and put it in the mending cabinet. She immediately goes and throws up, which takes her out of the room, at which point she hears the door, sees blurry Tyler in the jacket, thinks that it's Rendell and realizes she's wrong and freaks out. So let's talk about this moment. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but as Pete mentioned, this is a big moment to the comics because Nina gets dressed up in her best lingerie. She thinks Lendril is coming back. She caresses the back of her said's head. And in the comics, Tyler and Rendell look very similar. Yeah. Right. Uh, Connor Jessup and Bill Heck do not look very similar. No. So I think, I think they did a good job of it here. Like yes. It's not quite as horrifying. Yeah. But, I, but think, I like how it plays out. I think like Justin said... Uh, you know, they did a good job of like streamlining things and making it like taking it and moving it forward in a way that still encapsules encapsules what happened in the comic, but making a fun new choice with the TV show. Yeah, yeah, it it gets to the point without being so harsh. Um, yeah, so much of this episode and the issues that the comic book issues that that are used as source material here are super harsh. Like Kinsey and Nina have a but devastating arguments around um her yeah. drinking. And rather than that, we get we get sort of a softness and sort of a uh like an understanding and caring. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think that worked really well because we don't need that level of harshness. This doesn't mm-hmm. have the same tone and the same like horror vibe it has more of a, a dark fantasy vibe and and something that you know uh, gabriel rodriguez uh, talked about is like because this is the third iteration of the, that we're seeing this like the other two pilots didn't move forward uh we're seeing something that has been you know uh, uh they've worked on and worked on and, and tried different things and making such creative streamlined choices i think it's it's really helping uh, this be a better show. Yeah. Uh, of course, Nina freaks out. She grabs the urn and breaks the urn, which that As is very clearly her rock bottom. She runs yeah. away and cries. And then we get a really beautiful scene of Kinsey talking to Nina, uh, telling her she can't go back to drinking because we need you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, great, great for Kinsey, great, great for Nina. Just shows an incredible emotional growth from both of them, uh, and, and that's why I feel like that's the last we're going to see of her drinking. Because if she goes back on it, like that's especially fucked up. In yeah, the yeah, comics, but, it's a recurring thing that they have to sort of fight, and it's a big tempestuous thing in their relationship. Here, it feels like they do need her, and she has a much more of a role to play in the unraveling of the mystery than she did in the comic. So that's but that's why we still that. have two more episodes. And in the comic, there was a thing where like Dodge made her drink and that really fucked up Kinsey. And that could still happen. Yes. There's a lot of things that could happen. Wow. Sage words from Alex Albin. <laughs> the man who uh, saw too much, as we call yes. it. Uh, we briefly go back to the Whedon house. Uh, Ellie sees the broken action figure uh, and Lucas tells her he found out that Rendell put the Omega key in his own head. And then we get the cut back to the key house where Tyler finds it in between the ashes. And that's how we end the episode. Yeah. But what's fucked up is Kinsey's telling him that Lucas is uh Dodge 
And he's so focused on the key because the key's whispering to him. I don't think he hears her. So I hope that doesn't become an issue later. Oh, so like, do you want the beginning of the next episode to be like, hey, dumbass, did you hear me? Yeah, hey. exactly. That's how brothers and sisters should talk to each other. Stop listen listening up. to those chatty keys. <laughs> yeah, listen up. I'm fucking talking over here. Yeah. Want some uh, chowder you in your mouth? <laughs> Uh, that's the episode, Ray of Fucking Sunshine. Before we wrap it up here, let's unlock our key moments. What was our key moment of the episode? Pete, why don't you start us off? All right. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it's Rufus got activated this episode. Rufus mm. l- learned like, hey, maybe it's okay if I break ranks and do what I feel is right. He almost did that with Bodhi. And then when he finds out his fucking action figure was snapped in half, he's going to fucking lose it. And you he's don't want to mess with Rufus once he's angry. You don't want to see Rufus angry. Uh, what about you, Justin? I feel like I've been sort of beating this drum for a while. Um, it, it, it feels like the narrative is about Tyler going from being someone who is sort of reckless, careless, it doesn't really have anything to fight for into sort of hardening him and making him the hero that he needs to be. And in this episode, seeing him put on his dad's jacket, um, handling his mom with care um, and uh, making sure that everyone is feeling safe. The story is starting to really center on him and make him into the hero. Uh, and yes. along with Kinsey and to a lesser extent, Bodhi. But I think it's uh, that's what we need to be doing as we're ending the last getting into the last two episodes. Yeah, Uh, I would say just that one shot of Dodge and Kinsey crossing paths from the door. That's just such a smart, simple way of putting it all together. Um, It shows Kinsey moving forward into this mystery. She's certainly done a lot of things, but this is like her joining with Tyler and saying, "Okay, we're going to figure this out now and being an active participant in it. Uh, In the same way, Dodge making big moves in terms of entering this end game on the show as well. Yeah. All right. If you'd like to support our podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 PM at the people's improv theater loft in New York. Come on by. We will chat with you about lock and key socially. You can check us out at lock and key pod on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe and listen to the podcast. If you're checking it out on iTunes, please do leave us a comment. Those help us out quite a bit comic book club live for this podcast and more and whether you lock or you pork do whatever you want <laughs>